Oh, it's recording now. When it shuts off, does that mean it's not recording anymore? <laughs> I wouldn't say anything bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Andy Smith? Yeah, Eric Smith. Eric Smith, okay. One of the things I'd like to take this opportunity to do is share my screen okay. and show some teachers here before we begin um, where to find some of these resources on our new website. And I know most of the people that are going to watch this webinar have been training forestry teams and are probably well aware of where to find the rules. But I want to go over uh, some specific things to look forward to in the next contest, which is basically... A reboot right because we, we started using the scantrons and, and we're, we're doing things a little bit different here so if you go to the forestry website on our LAFFA page you'll see the registrations and those are important uh, every area has a different registration site it used to be one site now it's ultra important if you're from area one you should click this registration button because it's directly linked to only area one teachers and that site is going to shut down according to the date that the area one contest is going to be so so area one shuts down on september 20th area two shuts down on september 18th and i've, I've emailed those dates out um and that is within the rules of the new cde guidelines as far as registration deadlines so it's important that people register for their area contests um, according to whatever area that they're teaching in that's new for this year we've been over the rules all summer everybody's been through the scantron professional development one of the things i want to bring to people's uh, attention is what we call a competition card for forestry so so each student's going to be given one of these and it's basically a it'll be a one-page document I, I don't know why i didn't delete that second page but it'll basically basically be all the numbers that those kids will need for uh, equipment id uh, what we're going over tonight will be disorders well there's 21 disorders or excuse me there's 24 disorders and so those kids will use their bubble card um, to answer whatever's on the table to be identified, and they'll bubble in these numbers. So that's uh, these are the cards that we'll hand all the kids at the contest. The second competition card has to deal with mensuration, and this is not going to be graded, but the kids still need this information to, to get what they uh, need to bubble on their card to get their final total volume. So we put that on one sheet. Uh, for the kids. It'll probably be two separate sheets. I don't know that we'll do a front and a back because once the time limit is up, we'll probably be pulling or, or what's customary is with what we've seen in uh, these contests and what we'll probably do is pull this card after 30 minutes. So if kids don't have everything written down on their on their Scantron, they're going to be in a bind because we're not going to allow them to walk around the woods with these cards because then information could be shared. So make sure you add these to your practices. I think it's fitting that um, tonight we have two professionals from our Team Ag Ed school uh, up there in Ruston, Dr. Adams and Dr. Sims, who are experts in this, in, in forestry disorders. And um, I want to thank both of you for coming and sharing, uh, sharing your presentation that you prepared just for our kids and invest in this time, which is rightfully yours after, after hours in our program in our students and in our future. So I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to mute my microphone, Josh, so that y'all can uh, put your screen up or, or introduce yourselves and put your screen up and walk us through. Uh, okay. Disorders. Sounds good, Derek. So I'm, I'm Dr. Adams, uh, Louisiana Tech Forestry. Uh, with me is Dr. Sims. Um, she just started here at Louisiana Tech, so y'all are lucky to be the first ones to really get, get her expertise here here in North Louisiana. Uh, so we're happy to be here and help you with this uh, this project. Uh, we put a little presentation together on Friday, kind of break it down, look at those best ways to identify the different disorders. And we have a few samples in hand that we'll try to put on camera. We'll see, have to see how well they show up. Um, but we're, we're, so we'll go back and forth and now uh, she and I will take turns talking about the different disorders as we go. So we're gonna shift over and start the tree uh, disorder presentation here. And um, 
Is it showing up now? Yep, we can see it. Just in case the recorder doesn't, so, sometimes it picks up who's ever, whoever's talking. Um, and I don't want to do that because we, we want to do kind of a voiceover on your PowerPoint. Why don't you guys mute your uh, little camera button so that there's no way the recorder picks you up. It's totally focused on your... So that's, the, that, that's the mute microphone. No, nah, that's the, the microphone and the video are different. The, the video should be to your left. And if you can't, that's okay. I, I don't see that on my end, so... Oh, you don't see that one? No. Well, I can do it right here on my end. I'm going to mute. I'm going to stop your video. And okay. now only thing showing is your PowerPoint. And when you guys need to show a live sample, just say so, and I'll, I'll start your video. Okay. Back. That sounds good. Oh, okay. Well, so now we can see the PowerPoint, and we can hear you guys, um, but your PowerPoint has the floor. Okay. Very good. So uh, Dr. Sims and I went through the 24 um, potential disorders. And we kind of broke them down into three main groups for identification. Our, our first group, all of our insects. Second group are the fungi that won't be as necessarily as easily seen as a, as a bug. And the third one are kind of the, all the other things, the environmental effects, the mechanical issues, yeah, anything other than insects and fungi. So. For the purposes of, uh, of identification, we'll start off with insects today. And here are all of our insects that we're going that um, we can pull out of the list. So we're just going to go down the list here. The first one is the Asian longhorn beetle. This one is really not a huge threat down here in the south. It's more of an issue up in the Midwest, up through Massachusetts and New York. It affects most of our, a lot of our hardwoods in that area. It uh, eats the ash, maple, birch, poplar, and willow. Um, you want to say something about it? Um, sure. So uh, the Asian longhorn beetle is one of the reasons why you shouldn't move firewood from one location to another. It's a saying of buy it where you burn it, and it's to avoid spreading invasive species. Well, this species isn't a, a problem in Louisiana um, yet. We want to keep it that way. And so uh, good practices are important to uh, keep it from being a problem. Uh, as far as confusing this with any of the other species, it's not hard to confuse it. I mean, it's always very easy to identify. So it's a, a relatively large beetle with extremely long antenna. So if you look at the presentation, you have a male and female, and especially on the males, the antennas are almost sometimes twice as long as the body of the insect. They're very, very obvious. Uh, they produce small little round holes. You can see that in the lower pictures of some of these hardwood trees as well. Again, as far as a, the, the group of trees that they destroy, we're looking at a lot of these Midwestern, uh, Northeastern hardwood species. Not so much oaks, but our ashes, our maples, poplars, and willow. Uh, another wood borer that we'll see in a little bit is emerald ash borer. But you would be able to differentiate this one from that because in a whole stand, you'd have things other than ash being taken out by this insect. And if we could cut away, we have some live or some actual samples that we can pull. Eric, can you uh, take us to the main screen and we'll see how they show up? Yep, so I've, I've got your video back on. If you will just click uh, off of your share screen, it'll maximize your, your video. Okay, is it maximizing it now? Are we, can you see me? Yes, we can see you very well, very clearly. Okay. Let's see. Well, that's not going to show up very well. So I'm putting it right up to my screen. And Back it, it up just show, a little bit. It doesn't Back show it up, up very little. well. Can you see it? Yeah, back it up a couple inches. That's pretty good. Okay. So, yeah, about the – between my two fingers is the actual insect. And if we stretch out the antenna, the antenna is um, – over twice the length of the body. Hard to see on this screen, but it's uh, the antenna are just extremely long. It's the only insect on the list that's like that. 
but the insect itself is about the oops about the length of the tip of my finger. So I put that on my finger. It's about tw I guess twice the length of my fingernail. The actual insect. That distance show, it shows up really clearly at that distance. Okay, I hope it's better than on my screen. It doesn't look good on my. But the antenna, you know, the antenna is almost uh, almost as long as my finger. Extremely long antenna. So, uh, that, and that's the only one on the list that's like that, that has such a long antenna. And um, do you have students that are going to go out and look for these things, these insects? It's mostly just identification. Mostly just, yeah. so you, in Probably not. Have, no, okay. Okay, let's go back to the, um, I'm going to reshare the screen. And... Hopefully you can see the PowerPoint again, and we'll move the half off the Asian longhorn beetle. That brings us to the cicada. This one is one of the most common, uh, growing up is one of the most common things kids like to play with in the woods. They find the uh, cicada or the locust, I always call them locust shells. See that in the right picture. This time of the year, you're starting to see these, especially on pine trees. As they molt, they leave their shells on the pine trees. On the left picture, we see the actual insect. Um, and Dr. Sims and I were talking on Friday that when we were preparing for this, we didn't, I guess I never really considered my major forest threat unless they're in like serious, serious numbers. Uh, but usually they're not a big issue. Yeah, the main issue that they pose is if there's, someone's yard where they have a, a tree or a plant that's really um, aesthetically important to them. You know, they really care about it, what it looks like. And you get a whole bunch of cicadas that come out. Uh, the female will actually inject the eggs into the small branches and that can cause those branches to flag. So a single branch here and there might turn red and die. And so it might not look so good. As far as like overall tree mortality, it's not a big issue. Again, like Dr. Sim said, it's more of a yeah. aesthetic issue. You have that occasional branch here, or there, that flagging, as they say, you have that red, that dead red branch on the backdrop of green of the green tree that will die off, and that may be caused by the cicada. Again, I think everybody in Louisiana that's ever been in the woods has seen those little shells all over the pine trees when they molt. Anything else on this? Okay. Emerald ash borer. I mentioned this in the first slide. This is another um, borer of hardwoods. Unlike the longhorn beetle, this one does not have long antenna. It's also a nice emerald green color. And we will find one in a second to show you in real time. This one is relatively new on the scene in Louisiana. It's... Um, it was about 20 years ago, I guess now. It, came, it was introduced from Asia into the uh, Midwest, up up in your, uh, and up into Michigan. And the ash up there, they have a black ash species, and it's about 99% wiped out by this insect. And it's been slowly moving down. And it hit Louisiana about two years ago, I believe, uh, up north of Shreveport. And the prognosis does not look good for ash. Um, so a scenario for this one would be you're in a hardwood stand and all of your ash starts dying. Probably emerald ash borer. That'd yeah. be the the best and um, most common scenario you would see. If there's only ash getting eaten up by it, it's emerald ash borer. Uh, very, relatively large um, borer. You see on that picture on the left, it's about the same size of a penny. It leaves um, exit holes. Also, if you peel the bark away, you can see its paths that is in uh, where it's kind of engraved on the inside of the bark. Uh, it only affects the Oleaceae family, so that's our ashes. Uh, we have several species of ashes, and it also affects. Um, there's a Grancy Grancy Graybeard is another species in Louisiana that's in that family that it could affect. Um, if we could cut away, I'm going to stop sharing and we'll show you an actual emerald ash borer. Are we on video? 
Yep. Okay. So it's about half the size of the tip of my finger. It fits on my fingernail just about. But it's a nice green color. How's that coming across? Try backing it up a little bit, Josh. Yeah, that's about as clear as it's going to get. Okay. Uh, this is, I believe, the only green insect that we have on the list. So as far as identification, of, in this list, if it's a, if it's an insect and it's green, it's probably the Emerald Ash Borer. And in a scenario, if it only is eating ash, it's probably an Emerald Ash Borer. Do you have anything else? Does it have an a identifiable damage pattern? Yeah, so those uh, D-shaped exit wounds are very characteristic of the Emerald Ash Borer. And also, um, they can't fly very far, so they tend to affect ash that are within a localized area um, before they move on to the next area. So I'm going to go back to the shear screen. And um, if you look at that middle picture where that emerald ash borer is exiting, you can see it kind of looks like a D. It's, it's kind of cupped at the bottom and flat at the top. So that's that's the distinctive exit, exit wound. Uh, this is another one like the Asian longhorn beetle that um, why we see all the signs they do not move firewood. The number one way this one has moved is you know, people moving firewood from one area to the other. They don't have a very large array to spread uh, unless they hit your body with a human. Okay, after that one, we're going to move on to our gypsy moth. This one was originally native to Europe and Asia, and it mostly feeds on oaks and aspen. And we have two pictures here of the actual, what we consider the moth and the larvae on the right. And the larvae is the one we're actually really concerned with. This is the one that's the defoliator. And do um, you have anything to say on this one? Um. Yeah, so the, the moth that's pictured there is the male moth, and the female moth looks similar, but it's a white coloration. Um, so these, the populations of gypsy moths will get really big. It'll just be a huge outbreak. Um, but then they eventually die back um, from infection with a virus. So a really big outbreaks are characteristic of... Um, of gypsy moth, where you get a big outbreak that'll defoliate a lot of the plants, and then you'll get that dieback from a virus. Eric, are you still on? Eric? Hey, Eric, are you still on? My internet went off, um, so I've logged in on my phone, okay? Okay, do we need to start over? No, I can see the I can see your PowerPoint. Are you on the Gypsy Mall? Yeah. Yeah. So okay, you guys are good. I, okay. Um, do you uh, the only thing that happens I got kicked out. Our our recorder should still be there. Okay. So if you go to participants up there, you should see a little silhouette of a, a person, and it's got like the number four with it. If you click on that, and you see the person named seventy seventy in the room, that means we're still recording. Okay, we're still good. We're going to go back to Shear Spring. Okay. okay well, you you guys do your, I'm just be logged in here on my phone because uh, okay. my internet is down yeah, on my phone. Uh, I'm not sure. I always have the temp chat. Yeah, Microsoft Lives. Oh, yeah, so These are tent caterpillars. Okay. Uh, we didn't have a sample. Okay. So we're going to go back to this. So this was mostly a defoliator. This is uh, and mostly the larvae that we're concerned about. Uh, we have three species on this list that are we're mostly concerned about the larvae. So this is the first one. This one is predominantly, again, on oaks and aspen. So a scenario, and this is mostly going to be I think further north where you'd have defoliation of predominantly hardwood forests. Is that correct, Ms. Jackson? Yeah, so there it, it can affect other things besides hardwood, for example, hemlocks um, and pines, spruces, but it tends to be more on um, oaks 
Okay. Yeah. Okay, the next one is our bark beetles. Now, there are two bark beetles on the list, actually representing four different species. We have southern pine beetle, and we have ips. There are actually three different species of ips. So we have a few uh, pictures here to show you. On the left, we have, well, there are five beetles there. The, the largest one is the turpentine beetle, which is not on the list. And that's the one that's caught on there. You see it says Dendroctinus terebrans. And that's the largest of them. It's not on the list, so you don't have to know it, but that's the one most people misidentify as a more devastating beetle. That one is not uh, fatal. All of these, though, uh, really get after Lobolly Pine. And, and right now, over in Mississippi and Alabama, they're having a huge problem with the uh, Southern Pine Beetle. Southern Pine Beetle is very arguably the most destructive insect economically in the Southeast. That's the Dendroctinus frontalis. Very, very small beetle. And we have the beetles here, but, they, you know, I think they're going to be too small for the camera. The more I think about it, uh, but um, I they're, mean, they're tiny little beetles. You could maybe get an idea of the size. That's true. We're going to cut away, at least get a reference of the size of these. And they're tiny, tiny little beetles. Can... Hey, I mean, we'll be lucky to be able to see them. This is an ips here. Right. Right, the size of a grain of rice is what I read, right? Uh, I think that's smaller. <laughs> not sure. Thank I don't you. think it's going to pick up. Maybe. It's just right Can sitting we... up from the top of that pin there. That's the beetle. Should we put a white background behind it? Maybe. There we go. Can you see that? Yeah, that's working out really well. It's it got to focus on the beetle and not on the background. Okay. okay. That's the size of the smallest of the yips and the southern pine beetle. So they're just tiny little beetles. Uh, as far as big, do you have any uh, tips on identifying between the two? The um, and... For the ips, so the ips have a different numbers of spine on their rear portion. So um, if, if you looked with a microscope, then you would see that they have, I think the common ones here have four, five, and six spines. Yeah, that's right. So, um, and that, that's the main difference. And, and the Dendroctorus frontalis, that's the southern pine beetle, does not have spines. Is that correct? That's it's, right. It's got a smooth back end. Right. So if the students, so the scenario, and we're talking about lava olive pine, Mortality, these are big trees a lot of time. Big pine trees dying, and we know it's a beetle. We're trying to determine is it ips or is it southern pine? You look under a microscope, you look at that back end. If you see a rough back end, it's probably an ips. That's right. If it's smooth, it's um, southern pine. I'm going to go back to the shear screen, and uh, you can look at those five beetles. Uh, the three on the right are our ips. So look at their back end. And you can see how they kind of have these little spines on the back, or they're, they're rough edges. And, and it, they look a little bit concave too, whereas the dendroctinus looks more rounded. Uh, when we were preparing for this, I think maybe a really good way to show our scenario to give students would be able to give them the bark. So we put two pictures of the bark here on this slide. We have at the top, uh, at Ips, uh, these are the Ips galleries, and they tend to be like one main gallery and lots of little ones coming off kind of perpendicular to it, but more straight line. The Southern Pine, yeah, you know, I always say Southern Pine starts with an S, and the Southern Pine just kind of goes everywhere. It kind of has, um, kind of form, makes S's, and, and they're, not, they're not straight lines. So, Potentially, you could give a student two different pieces of bark and ask them to identify them. And we're going to cut back to our um, our live shot and show you a couple pieces of bark. Let's see how this shows up. Now, which one is that? So this is the Dendroctinus frontalis, so the southern pine beetle. If you can see that it's sort of S-patterned, 
uh, galleries on the inside of the bark. Okay. And then on this piece, there are actually <coughs> both types, but the wider ones down here that sort of look more elongated and are wider, those are the ips. And they're not wavy, they're more straight line. Mm -hmm. So this would be a good scenario to give a student, just give them a piece of pine bark and um, ask them what, what insect caused that. And first, the first giveaway is that it's pine. And it's, it's a, uh, and you can see where those insects you know, eat on the pine, you see their galleries. Again, if it has kind of a wavy S shape, it's southern pine. If it's that st more straight line, it's going to be ups. Okay, so that's a good, good, easy scenario to give a student. Do they um, both? Uh, huh? They both produce the same type of entry wound or pitch tube. Yeah. So on the exit side, what you mostly see it looks like a shotgun went off, and you see little, like little BBs coming out. That that's mostly what what you'll see. Um, let me switch to the next side. The the other the, the one difference that you'll see are the pitch tubes. So this is where the sap, the rosin's coming out. It's a self defense mechanism of the tree. And on the right on this slide uh, is an old graphic of where these occur on the tree. So what most people are thinking are southern pine are actually those big black turpentine beetles. You see the pitch tubes first four or five feet on the tree. That's the turpentine beetle, which is now on the list. If you get on the main bowl of the tree, and we're talking about you know, maybe uh, maybe eight to sixteen feet up, I guess, mm -hmm. on the pine, on the on a mature lavalle pine tree, and we see pitch tubes, that's probably southern pine. Where we see the ips are much higher up in the four to six inch or less um, diameter area of the tree. So you might see like the four spine likes like twigs really and, and small limbs. And as we go further down, you get the five, the five spine and the six spine ips. But all the ips are still looking for relatively small, small diameters of the tree. But again, the southern pine likes to hit that big part of it. So, so uh, as another scenario would be you find pitch tubes, but they only occur on the upper limbs of a tree. And that would be ifs. Yeah. Does that help, Eric? Yeah, so they actually start at the top of the tree and work their way down? Yeah, they tend to. The tough thing with all of these is, is where you have one, many times you'll have others that follow. Once you get that weakened tree, a lot of them kind of latch on. Um, but the ifs, especially ifs isn't a really huge problem except in really bad years. Yeah. And you'll have these small outbreaks. A small, small mortality. The southern pine, that's the one where you have a you know, thousand acres just dead. Right. So another, if, if the pines are really, if it's a really bad drought year, <laughs> then that would be a year where more trees are going to get attacked by ifs. And, and right now, like I said, Mississippi and in Alabama, and I think it just moved over into Louisiana and maybe some of the Florida parishes, we're having the first major outbreak of southern pine beetle in about 15, 20 years. I mean, it's killed several thousand acres. So, um, yeah, so another scenario would be if it's a really bad outbreak of beetles on pines, what is it? And that would be southern pine beetle, whereas yeah. it's a drought year and a few pines are affected in small areas. What is it? It's ifs. Right, right. Got that. Uh, so of all the of all the insect species, these two would be the most easily confused together. I would think these would be the most easy mess. But if you break it down, it's mature pine. You know it's one of these. And we know it's a it's boring into the wood. So then it's a question of which one. Uh, so again, looking at where it's occurring on the tree how big the acreage is of the outbreak. And uh, if you had a microscope, you could make them look under the microscope and look at that back end, or look at the galleries under the bark. So there's still a lot of ways we can 
we could hypothetically um, test them on this. You got any other questions on this one while we're here? No, I think that's wonderful coverage of that one. Okay. We well, just got a few more insects left. This one uh, is another one that can get pines. Uh, some species of saw fly can get hardwoods too, but here in the southeast, it's mostly the, the pines that we're concerned with, right, Dr. Sons? That's right. Um, and again, like the uh, gypsy moth, we're really worried about the larvae. And in massive quantities, they can defoliate our seedlings. Uh, you know, like I said, if, if we're dealing with loblolly pine or, or any of our pines and they're mature and they're dying, it's probably going to be bark beetle. If we're looking at a young stand of trees, seedlings, saplings, and all of a sudden they don't have any needles, could be this one. Uh, and they just, they eat the, the needles, the females lay eggs on the needles and deform them. Uh, what else you want to say about this one? Um, yeah, and if they were trying to differentiate, for example, sawfly larvae from the moth larvae, mm -hmm. um, then what they could do is the sawflies tend to have really uh, well-developed heads and simple eyes. So their heads look a lot different. Also, um, you can see they, ha they have a lot of what are called pro legs in the back. And um, three, uh, three true legs in the front. So the caterpillars will have those true legs in the front, but they have less pro legs, which are those short, sort of stubby looking legs toward the end of the. That's a good point. That's yeah, good point. toward yeah. the end of the larvae. Yeah. So yeah, so if you had both larvae on the test, you, you could look at those, those pro legs. You see that really good on the picture on the right. The, the you can see the pool legs on that one. Yeah, and those three forward legs toward the front are the true legs, and then the little stubs um, toward the end are the pro mm -hmm. legs. So again, as far as differentiating the specimens, you can look at the pro legs. Uh, as far as a scenario, we're talking about young pine plantation, you're thinking yeah. saw fly. That's we're right. talking more northern hardwoods, we're talking more uh, gypsy moth. Gypsy moth okay. 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 Um, this one's an odd, an odd one. It'd be hard. I think it's gonna be hard to tell. Maybe unless we get some microscopes. And that's our nematodes. Whole array of species of nematodes. They're pretty gross looking. They're little little insects, little animals. Mm -hmm. Usually associated with soil soils. They get infestation of the soils causes root diseases. The middle picture are callus roots caused by those nematodes. I guess they burrow their way into the roots, right, Dr. Sims? Yeah, they can burrow or they can be on the surface of those and actually cause those root uh, systems to, uh, to form those galls on them. In extreme cases, they cause mortality. You get some of these soils that are just inundated with nematodes and you just cannot grow anything in them. It's a big problem in uh, greenhouses and nurseries where they do intensive, um, very intensive uh, growing of, of seedlings. It, it's not usually a huge problem of trees out in the forest, but there are other plant species in Louisiana that are affected like sugar cane, um, soybean, and sweet potatoes. So a scenario Again, this would probably be more of an issue in our in our nursery settings, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, this is also something, I don't know if it's on the agronomy test, but I can see it being a, maybe on that kind of a test because it is a really big issue, I know, in the, in the ag world. And in, in nurseries, even though they're usually in the, in the soil, in nurseries, you can even have foliar nematodes. Hmm. And um, interestingly, there is one important nematode of, forests um, in, in pines. I don't know that it's a, here in Louisiana at all, um, but we there are in the United States nematodes in pines that are foliar and are moved by longhorn beetles. They aren't a problem in the U.S., but if we move plants from the U.S. to, for example, Japan, then they can be a problem there. So... Yeah, this will be an interesting one to do on a test uh, outside of using a microscope. 
I think I, I think the you know, probably the most common way this one could be posed to students would be give them a bit, uh, some actual roots that have been infestated. I think. Yeah, that might be a good way to do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, scales. This is one I I often think of. I have a bigger issue with these in my uh, in my garden. Little tiny insects, and they like to suck the sap out of the trees. Um, especially in greenhouse set, that's where I have the biggest problems in greenhouse yeah. settings uh, when I'm trying to grow my trees and, uh, and more of an issue on smaller trees because they can't come back from it but they just they suck the, the sap out it's like little vampires all over the all over the foliage and the stems yeah and both scales and um, aphids uh, can ca can produce honeydew um, and city molds may be associated with those. Yeah. So honeydew is the excretion from these scales and uh, and potentially aphids, and uh, the fungus is, is a mold fungus that grows on to the honeydew, mm -hmm. and that could that's just kind of a secondary problem, but that that can actually sometimes be the worst problem. You get a lot of honey um, city mold on it, and then it can't get sunlight into the leaf, and it just can't it's completely covered with that mold further injuring the plant usually they're they're more a nuisance than a true problem um as far as the plant health in the outdoors if you're outside of a greenhouse but they can be a, a nuisance in street trees especially if you walk along and you get under a tree with a lot of scales or aphids and then there's a lot of honeydew your feet might stick to the sidewalk yeah. It's kind of a gross one, really. <laughs> uh, but again, out in the in the in the forest setting, this one probably isn't as big an issue as maybe a nursery or greenhouse setting. That's right. Okay, our tent caterpillars. This is our third larvae that we're really concerned with, and this is one I I have probably my earliest remembrances of a forest insect where the tent caterpillars because they make such a distinctive tent. Uh, they kind of spin a web like you would think a spider would, but up in these trees. I generally see them around here mostly in like pecans. For some reason, I really like pecans. But they they spin these webs um, usually in, in late spring, early summer, and they, they live in there. They'll be full of these caterpillars that come out when the weather's good and just defoliate all they can. They eat the leaves. And I have seen in extreme cases a couple of years ago, in fact, um, I um, saw a, a nice oak stand that just got them really bad. They defoliated a lot of them. That's, that's kind of the unusual thing. Um, do you have the same I thing? thought we had some, but it looks like they're both um... Oh, I grabbed the wrong one. So this one, they're, they're kind of hairy little caterpillars. Um, much They got the little hairs on them, unlike the, um, the sawfly ones, a little oh, bit that's, smoother. That's right. uh, and the other real distinctive thing are the are their houses they build those webs they spin up in the top of the trees so this is one i could see giving them that picture on that right cutting down a, a twig just inundated with web and all the you know the dead caterpillars and the the crafts from the, the, fra the yeah. fra frass from the uh, caterpillars and, and things like that so uh but that one's all over louisiana it's very common except in those extreme cases it's not a big, big mortality issue. It's just very, very unbecoming of stately trees to have them all over, especially in a, a suburban setting or urban environment. Um, but it, they, you know, again, in, in severe cases, they could just tear up a tree's foliage. Yeah, usually it's not a problem, but it's possible. Um, and that takes us, so we're done with insects. Uh, we have four fungi that, um, are on this disorder list. The first one we'll go over is the butt heart rot. This can be caused by a whole slew of different fungi. In this part of the country, it's probably most commonly seen in hardwoods, I would think, especially our bottomland hardwoods. Uh, Dr. Sims, you want to talk some more about this? Well, with it occurs in conifers too, but it's usually in um, older trees, so more mature trees. So um, you know, and a lot of the pines, you know, that are only grown for about 30 years, 
the butt and heart rots aren't going to be a big issue. It's going to be in those older trees where you'll find it. And it's not always a problem. Um, they actually uh, can help with wildlife habitat. Um, so woodpeckers and stuff need uh, need heart rots in order to be able to build um, their nesting areas. So they need that as well as some other animals like squirrels and things. Um, yeah, so that, that brings up a good point for a scenario. You could, uh, a good one, and this actually happens, is if you work for the Forest Service and you're, you are selecting large old pine trees for the endangered species red calcated woodpecker you would want a tree as if what, what disease would you want you'd want a tree that's infested with heart rot that's right because that would help that endangered species uh it's the interesting thinking that you want to manage for something that rots a tree but that's actually a very often prescribed management plan in the forest service what was that Mm, that was somebody logging in. Um, okay. Josh, or doc, Dr. Adams, Dr. Laura. Um, something we were doing last year, preparing for nationals for the National Forestry Contest and, and preparing the team, we were taught, and I forgot who showed me this, but the, the conch mushroom is actually an indicator that a tree has. Right. Has and we're going to we're gonna come back to our video and show you one. Let me... Uh, Stop sharing here. Uh, can you see me? Eric? Are we back to video? Yep, you're back on. Okay, Dr. Sims has a couple that she's going to show you. Yeah, and so a, a tree that has um, stem decay or heart rot or butt rot. In front of this so they can see it. Um, might have a conch on it as well, like conchs. Can you see that? Probably need to get a little bit closer. Yeah, yeah that's good. So those are mushrooms? Yeah. And so these are um, some mushrooms that you might find. Or when they're shelf-like like this, they tend to be called conchs. And they'll be coming out of the side of the tree. And that's a sign that the tree um, has a butt and a heart rod. Um, so, so that that would be a good indication on a standing tree, a good indication on a standing tree that it probably has some heart rot in it. And um, one of these uh, fungi that produces a conch like that actually produces a cubicle rot. So, and it's where the the um, wood actually breaks up into what look like cubes. That's just an indication of decay. It's a brown rot. So you can see right here, it kind of has these cubes. It, it, it breaks it out almost like in squares or in cubes. And that's an indication that, that that tree had the rot. That's what she's talking about. Does that answer your question, Eric? Yeah, yeah. I, w I want to give these guys that are watching this as many indicators as yeah. they can. So really th this is one I think you could you could pose it in a lot of different ways. In a contest, you could cut a um, a cookie out of a tree. Uh, let me go back to my screen. You could cut a cookie in, out of the tree, like the picture on the presentation there, and say, what is that? Heart rot or uh, butt rot. Uh, otherwise, you can give them a cock like she just showed you and say, what was that? That's, uh, you know, the, that's the reproductive uh, part of that fungi. Or you could give them maybe a management scenario. You're managing for what red cockade woodpecker. What disease would you want? Would you actually want to manage for in longleaf pine? And that would be heart rot. So I think there are several ways you could test for for that one. Uh, anything else you want to say on this one? Nope, I think that's it. Any other questions on this one? No, sir. All right. Um. Next one is cankers, and this is a there's a whole host of fungi that form cankers, and really what makes a canker is continual reinfection, and then the tree trying to grow over it, and then reinfection, and the tree trying to grow over it, and it just 
base these what we call cankers on the tree. And, and Dr. Sims, you want to talk more about this one? Sure. Um, and that regrowing, that callus and regrowth uh, that Dr. Adams was talking about, and that it produces a target shape on the on the tree. And one of the ways you can differentiate a canker, for example, from um, mechanical damage, which we'll talk about in a little bit, is that a canker is caused by a fungus. So that's, that's different. So mechanical damage is going to be caused by a person or, or some other agent, but a canker is going to be caused by a fungus. Yeah, one thing I, I've, I know when I teach my, my students about a canker is to think about a, uh, a bow and arrow target. So, because you have that continual infec infection at the same place, then the tree tries to heal over there. Reinfection at the same place, heal over. So it almost puts like a, a ring pattern, like you would see on a, a target for archery or, or, or a gun range. Uh, that mechanical, and like she says, the tree will grow over it, but usually it's very odd for that mechanical to be in that same spot every time. So you wouldn't expect to see that ring pattern. Oftentimes, depending on the fungi, you might see some oozing, some something, some other indication that there's a fungus, some discoloration, like you see in these pictures on the left, uh, where you have that red staining or orange, I guess it's orange staining on that tree. That would also lead you to believe it's some type of fungi. Okay. Yeah. And as far as far as a scenario, um, you know, these things infest lots of different species because there's lots of different fungi that cause these. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm not sure what kind of scenario you could put in there except that you, know, you have a, an injury on the tree and it has a bullseye pattern on it, something like that. Otherwise, we'd have to just put the whole and tree it's, in there. Well, and you could let them know, you could say this is caused by a fungus. Yeah, that's true too. You know, if you tell them this is caused by a fungus and it caused a canker shape wound on there. Right, what is yeah. it? Okay. Is there an opportunity for cankers and butt rot to, uh, are, is one caused by the other? No, it's, these are different, these are different fungi. And the canker, I think you usually will, see, you'll see that one. I mean, you'll see you know, that a lot of times they're caused on the main bowl or on a, on a limb that kind of a bowed out section of the tree is more visible on the outside of a heart rot tree usually the only indication you'll have on it is that conch potentially or if you hit yeah. the tree and you hear a hollow spot you know you hear the hollow sound yeah that would be an indication too yeah sometimes the the trees that have a, a butt or i call them just stem stem decays sometimes they will display other symptoms like um, they could have chlorosis or some type of canopy dieback, but a lot of times they don't. And yeah, um, just like Dr. Adams said, uh, really that indication that it's there is that you have a conch. Um, and some of some can depending on the species, some cankers are fatal, some are not. There's a lot of variation in this in this group so yeah. I, um, so one one scenario would be if you have a, a bunch of understory trees that have these canker um, type wounds on them it may make them less competitive in a forest system uh it wouldn't be applicable in louisiana but on nationals or especially where nationals usually is if the canker that is ravaged up there is the butternut canker and um I can see that as a scenario. Our, all of our butternuts have died, and we're worried about our walnuts now. What are we worried about? It's the butter, is the canker, butternut canker, uh, that's really causing the demise of that species. That'd be more of a nationals level issue, I think. Okay, our uh, next one is damping off. This is one of our most uh, devastating diseases in nursery conditions. Um, I know Dr. Jackson in his agronomy class talks about this a lot, his nursery class. Uh, one of our main nursery issues that impact forest, forest nurseries, or any nursery for that matter, for all of our ag teachers in the, in the tomato, the greenhouse tomato business, they face this a lot, I know. Uh, Dr. Sim, do you want to chime in? 
Yeah, so with damping off, you're going to be um, really looking at the very young seedlings. Um, just post-emergence, a lot of times, this is where this is an issue. You can either have pre-emergence or post-emergent um, damp damping off. But what usually happens is the um, plant from the seed will just break the surface and then be become infected um, with the fungus. And that's what causes the plant to collapse and, and die. They usually don't survive that infection. Um, in a nursery setting, it'll usually be with, within an area since these are in the soil. If the soil is contaminated with the fungus, it usually all happens in one area within the nursery altogether. Yeah, and I guess the, the big thing to look for and I'm sure probably like I said every ag teacher that does greenhouse tomatoes has seen this where it looks like the the stem that little green stem just kind of implodes on itself and it um, it just falls over and it, it's it's that fungus that gets in there collapses it collapses the stem and just just takes it out Again, this is probably the most common fungal issue in, in any greenhouse, but definitely in our tree nurseries as well. Uh, this is one of the things they have to fumigate the soil for um, regularly, so damping off. Okay, this is a big one, rust. And there are lots of different types of rust. The most devastating one in the southeast will occur. Um, or the injury economically will occur on uh, our pine trees, loblolly pine and slash pine are some of the most susceptible to it. And this is one that we see the most of. It causes, um, and, and the, the one specifically for that is fusiform rust. And on the pictures on the uh, presentation, you can see the picture on the right, kind of an orangey, orangey white rust. The picture on the left is actually the alternate host. So this species is kind of different. Uh, the rust species, they, they switch hosts. They go from a hardwood to a pine, hardwood to a pine. So if you had, so in the Southeast, like a, a water oak is one of the most uh, common alternate hosts. And you could see the little, uh, at certain times of the year, you can see little rust postules on the bottom side of these water oak leaves. It does not hurt the oaks. But once it gets into that conifer, it can really cause some major damage. Uh, there's several different types of rust. The pictures here are actually, um, what, what type of rust was this? That, uh, was, this um, white pine that was white pine blister rust. rust. It's the same life cycle. Yeah. Uh, different, a little bit different species of host, but still yeah. that conifer hardwood, conifer hardwood. We're going to switch over to our view and show you the most common um, lava like pine and slash pine. And um, are we back live? Yep. Okay. So you can see right right here is a big swelling on this lava like pine. And you can't see the nice orange rust on it anymore. Usually you'll see that uh, about what, March or April around here. I think you'll see it really turn nice bright orange. Uh, but you know, this one's been cut for a few years, but you see this big postule here. This would be the swelling of the fungus. Uh, causes extreme economic loss to the tree. If it completely girdle it, it could actually cause mortality. Also very prone to break stem breakage right about there as a weak spot. Well, it happens on, uh, it can happen on the trunks or on larger branches as well. It also does occur on on the smaller branches. So here's an example of a smaller one. So you can still see the swelling right here in the twigs. Of course, that wouldn't be as big an issue. I mean, it does it does affect you know, marginally the growth of it. The biggest issue is if it were to girdle it, it would could kill it, or that's a weak spot economically. That's a that's a a flaw in the wood. Yeah. Is that our only samples? I thought we had one. I thought we had one more. Maybe not. Um, I think that's it. Again, in this area, our loblolly pine is susceptible. It's been bred out a lot. Slash pine is the worst in this area for, for that type of rust. 
And again, it is a really kind of a pretty orange color to it. It's just devastating though. Yeah. You get a lot of it. Uh, very, there's a lot of genetic control to the resistance. Um, and it's, at least it was the most common fungal disease in uh, Southern forest. Uh, it probably still is. Is there a way to determine that swollen uh, postule from a canker? So that there... postule probably will not have that that bullseye, yeah. that bullseye look if you were to cut into it. And, and really the, the canker is usually more of a depression. Not, yeah. Let me describe it as a depression. This is more of a swelling. Yeah, so with the canker, you may have a little bit of swelling on the outside edge where the callus from the tree is growing, but um, with the rust fungus, you're really going to have something that, and actually it might, we, we don't have gall on here, but it, you know, it, it could yeah. be confused with other bacterial galls or something like that, but uh, it really <coughs> descends out um, from the branch yeah. or the stem. So, yeah, so Again, think canker, we're thinking uh, depression, uh, and uh, fusiform is going to be a swelling. So that'd be two, that'd be an easy way to differentiate those two yeah. for, for the purposes of, of this, for this one. Okay, I'm going to go back to the presentation. And, and another thing you could do again is you could give them a, if it's the right time of the year, you could give them a water oak leaf that you can find that little orange rust on and say, what is this? That could really throw them off. I might do that for area one. <laughs> okay, so that concludes insects and fungi. Now, do we have any questions up to this point? No? Okay. We're well, we're gonna go on to the last big haul. And that is our other. We do that's everything, our hodgepodge of other things. So we'll start off with chemical damage. Sure. And you know, some of these other ones, we had, there's so many options out there for chemical damage. And when I think of chemical damage, I think of herbicide damage. Um, Dr. Sims brought up uh, salt water damage uh, for our ag teachers down in the South. When you have salt intrusion, I know that's going to be a bigger, bigger issue. Uh, that could be a very common, common issue as well. Um, the picture on the, the left uh, with those hedges is actually, Dr. Sims found that that was, uh, you said that was salt damage? Yeah, it's salt damage. So if you do get a really bad ice spell, I know they aren't super common here in Louisiana, but if you do get an ice event and you salt the street or you salt along the sidewalk, you put a lot of salt out, then it can affect the plants that are directly surrounding those. Um, the damage usually tends to be pretty uniform. So like on the hedges in the picture to the left, you can really see that where the, the plant leaves have died or the, that red color, it's very uniform across all of those hedges. And that's um, very typical of a lot of abiotic uh, uh, problems of plants or um, problems that are caused by for example, chemicals or something, something else yeah. besides living organisms. The, the most common one we'll probably see is inadvertent herbicide damage. So the pictures on the right are really good examples of that, where you have deformation of the leaves. You usually will have a cupping effect. And you see the, on the bottom looks like maybe a probably a southern red oak that got hit with herbicide, and you have that cupping of the leaf. Yeah, you may curling, also see a curling. Um, deform leaves that don't fully form. So like in the in the top image, those leaves really didn't fully form. So and they reach their full size. In extreme cases, I mean you might see die back where it dies back to the to the main stem or or maybe dies all together uh, slowly. Another thing you might see is uh, chlorosis or yellowing of the leaves. Mm -hmm. uh, we see that a lot um, with some of the different herbicides. Uh, but th that would be a, a good, I think the most common would be if someone inadvertently hitting a tree with round, a, a low dosage of Roundup, and it does not kill the plant, but it'll cause this kind of uh, weird leaf structure on the, on the, on the plant. That, that's so common. 
because everybody's a little loose and happy with their roundup. Yeah, so um, a possible scenario would be is, you know, you're going out and you're trying to get rid of some weeds and you're using some herbicide to get rid of the weeds, but it's a really windy day and the herbicide blows onto the, the tree. What kind of damage would you expect? And you'd expect a chemical damage. Another good scenario, and I see this all the time over in the Delta, is uh, you have a stand of hardwood trees next to a cornfield, and that corn's round up ruddy. Mm -hmm. And all the trees in the 40 acres next to it look really weird. And it's because you just oh, get that, great. you get that little bit of drift from that cornfield when they spray it with that crop duster. That That is so common in the Delta, especially that edge on that cornfield. Uh, climatic injury, we we're trying to think of, of what we could put here. Uh, uh, so many different climatic injuries you could put here. Uh, the one that comes to my mind, especially when we're in hurricane season, is hurricanes uh, and all the nice little spinoff tornadoes they call. So major stem breakages, like the picture on the left. You know, we've all lived through enough hurricanes in this part of the world where we've seen that or seen the tornadoes go through. Um, a tornado, you know, you would have, because it's cyclonic, you'd have stems in all different directions. If it was just a pure hurricane, you'd see a bunch of stems pretty much all in one direction. Uh, another one that would be common that we could think of would be that ice or frost damage. You want to talk more about that one? Yeah, um, and so if, if you've got ice and frost damage, um, one thing that's indicated with frost damage, a lot of times if, if you get new growth that comes out in the spring and it's very young and tender foliage, and then uh, it gets super cold and then that sensitive foliage will actually die back. And so that bottom picture on the bottom right where the foliage has all turned brown, um, that's an indication of uh, frost damage. Uh, the picture on the right is a pine tree that's laying. That's more. So we have. She talked about frost damage. If you had severe ice damage, freezing rain type stuff, and we, you know we have that in North Louisiana every five or seven years, it seems. You'll have uh, the trees will will lean over like that. Picture on the right, and they'll never really grow out of that. So if you have a stand, and I've seen whole stands of, of eight inch trees that all lean over like that, they just never grow out of it. And that would be an indication of, of climatic injury due to ice damage. I, I'm just curious, anybody else think of any other climate injuries um, common to Louisiana? Those are the ones we could think of. No one? I'm listening to you guys. I mean, I don't, I don't really have much to add. But okay. I, we were bring, on a couple of these, we just brainstormed and we couldn't. That's what we'd come up with. I'm just curious. <laughs> okay, I mean, we'll go to the next one. In these national national events, when you talk, when you start dealing with weather and climate, it's not really fair to have a, a single limb on a table and expect somebody to be able to identify it as, as weather damage. So a lot of times you see these these pictures of something in the background where you can kind of get a get an idea. Of, yeah. Uh, yeah, this one we had to think about this one a little bit. Um, yeah, down unless you have a whole photo or some background information to really tell that it was a, a yeah. flood at that or a hurricane or something. And, and you know, usually climatic stuff, we're talking about more landscape wide stuff, so we're talking yeah, so, large acreages, yeah. And then in other part, like for nationals, for other parts of the, the country, there could be stuff like um, the red belt dieback where you get whole groups of trees across the landscape that will turn red um, for a year because of the fast like freezing and thawing event. Um, also that happens up, there's something similar like uh, the yellow, I think it's called yellow cedar decline up in Alaska, um, where that's caused from, um, it's a, considered a climatic, climatic injury um, where you know, usually the root systems are protected by the snow, but with the warming of the climate, they actually, those uh, root systems thaw out, then the snow turns to ice and freezes the surface roots. So then you'll see those, um, yeah, you'll see those uh, die back. So for, for other places, um, 
in the country, there are some other uh, climatic injuries that we might run across. Okay. Fire damage. Um, easiest way to look for this one is look for charring. Uh, a lot of times, too, in a stand setting, you'd see the charring a lot of times on the same side. All the trees would have it on the same side. It's usually that fire is moving in one direction. So it's moving one direction, and you have that fire sitting at the base of the tree or just on one side oftentimes. So a lot of times, the damage will all be on the side away from the direction it's moving. So it just it just sits there. The wind's not able to move it off the tree, and it kills those cells. This will cause uh, can cause the that area of the tree to die. A lot of times you get other fungus moving in or insects moving in afterwards. The picture on the right looks like an old uh, old eucalyptus tree, or probably uh, it was severe severe burning. That was obvious. But you look for that charring at the base. Uh, a lot of times, even high. Uh, of course, obviously, high intensity fires damage a tree. It can move up to the top of the tree. Uh, but even just a, a fire that just sits at the base of the tree, especially on our real thinned species bark, uh, thin bark species. Uh, so we're talking about uh, beeches, uh, magnolias, maples. Um, yeah, it can really wipe those out fairly easily. They got thin bark and they can cause, if not mortality, extreme. Um, damage to the base. Similar to that, and often causing the fire, would be lightning damage. And uh, this was pretty easy. We had we have a tree out out of our, our building that got struck a while back, and uh, you know you're going to generally see a long strip all the way from the top to the bottom, and this one should be easy to find. Uh, to identify because you just have that, that streak, the lightning mark. Um, I don't want much else to say about that one because it's, it's just so unique. In fact, obviously any tree that gets struck by lightning. Yeah, if you've got a long narrow strip where the bark is missing and perhaps the wood is blown out, um, it's more than likely uh, lightning. Yeah. Uh, mechanical damage, the most common, I'd say the two most common things in this area that we're going to see is more the urban, suburban area where you have weed eaters and lawnmowers hitting the base. So that'd be the top picture. A lot of times this occurs over and over and over again. You know, you try to mow as close as you can and, and you score up the tree. That's what we see at the top. The second, in the, in the more industrial forest, you're looking at uh, logging damage. So you're skidding that tree out of the woods. You may even have a pivot tree to turn it on and you're just skidding that tree up all the time. Uh, again, this is often associated later on with other, especially hard with other fungus coming in because you are, you're scoring the tree, you're opening it up to infection or, or insects. But uh, you're looking at, um, I guess just damage to the bark and uh, you should, should be able to see the wood under underneath. Yeah, I mean, also, if you, you know, you have got one tree standing and another tree, you know, that's down on the ground right next to it. Um, a lot of times you can tell uh, that the tree that fell hit the tree as it went down. And you'll actually see the mark and the mechanical damage on the standing tree where the tree that fell hit yeah. it. And this is one that we would expect mostly in isolation. Yeah, you, know, you wouldn't see it. 100 acres of the same injury you'd see one here one way over there unless everybody's a really bad mower and hitting all the trees but uh this one should be fairly isolated you at least you hope um, this is one I, I try to find a sample for and they were all too tall uh this one we didn't know where to put it in it is a, a biotic pest but it does not fit with our insects or our fungus and it is mistletoe. And uh, while people like to hang it up during Christmas, it is a parasite, which I always thought was ironic considering people like to kiss on her, but it's a nice parasite. And it is a plant, but it grows, it, I guess, uh, it, well, it has, does it have form roots in it? Or they grow into the tree? I'm, I'm not sure they're the not morphology. True, they're not true roots. I think they're, they're the rhizoids or rhizoids. Huh. some other, they're not 
true roots, I don't think. Um, they generally cause minimal damage because the leafy mistletoes actually photosynthesize themselves. So um, photosynthesis is a process is, of, you know, forming its own uh, nutrition and it's making its own sugars. So it really only parasitizes those trees mainly for water and for minerals. So, um, yeah, it, it just latches on. And when I take my classes, my tree ID classes through campus, in the middle of our campus, we have some, some Bradford pears that are infested with this stuff. Mm -hmm. And at first glance, you know, you think, well, that's just part of the tree. It grows, I mean, just right out of it. And um, it's got green stems, green leaves. It looks like it's supposed to be there, but it's actually a different species. Uh, transported by birds, small mammals. Mm -hmm. They get up in the tree and leave those uh, fruiting bodies up there and it germinates and grows into the host. See it a lot in our oaks, our, most just hardwoods. Um, it's very easy to see in the winter when the tree loses all of its leaves and you still have green up there. And that's the mistletoe. Yeah, and so um, in some places, uh, in, in when there's a lot of mistletoe in oak trees, uh, people actually refer to it um, incorrectly as a, as a mistletoe tree. Um, and I guess in extreme cases, it, it is weakening the plant at that is, point. Yeah, so. if, it's, if it's a really severe infestation, um, I think you could expect the branches of the trees that are infested to, to break off in a windy event more readily than a tree that's not infested with mistletoe. Uh, and again, this is our only plant on the list, so it should be easy to identify. And uh, honestly, I can't think of a, a what very, plant is a parasite. Yeah, yeah from I the can't list. think of a scenario that would make this one difficult. Uh, this one should be a very easy one, unless they just totally didn't look at the list. Um, yeah, that's all I can think about this one. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess we probably should put this one in. Fungi, maybe. No, because it's not. It's, it's not, not fungi. fungi. It's, it's I'll let not you talk about this one. You know, but this one better than I. Okay, so <laughs> what with slime fungs isn't really a health issue for the tree, um, but it does look bad, um, and it can cause damage to the wood. So if you're trying to harvest um, the wood, um, it can cause the tree, the the actual wood, to warp. Um, and look bad. The wet wood uh, smells bad too. So if you cut into a wet wood tree and you smell those areas, it, it uh, sm can smell sour, sort of vinegary. Um, but uh, it's also referred to as slime flux. When that happens, it's actually that additional microorganisms. So what causes the bad smell in wet wood? is bacteria, but it's not actually a bacteria infection. It's um, the bacteria get into the wood after this pressure builds up in the tree and some damage is caused. And then, then the bacteria gets in and causes that smell. If you get additional microorganisms, then they cause a slime. And so that's when wet wood sort of changes into a slime flex when you have those additional organisms in there. Um, it can cause a bleaching and also a dark staining on the surface. So you see this a lot um, in, in bottomland hardwoods especially. Um, I, I've seen it a lot. I, I guess, it, I know a few times I've cored into a tree mm -hmm. and when you pull that core out, it like sprays really bad smelling yeah, water, it, and I guess that's what this is. Huh? Yeah, so it actually, yeah, pressure builds up in there, and it can actually squirt out the foul-smelling um, liquid. Huh. Okay. And that it, it's usually in hardwoods, but it can also happen mm. in, in fur, true furs as well. Okay. So some, some uh, folks don't like to cut down true furs. That are infected because it smells really bad and the spurting can be really bad too. And I guess the big indication on this would be like the picture shows where you have it looks like somebody poured a bucket of tar on the tree almost or you know so bleach and yeah, then something. Tar. Yeah. So it's bleached out and then you it got just kind like of flows down streak. over. Yeah. yeah. 
So that, that's kind of unique as far as the other ones on this list, I believe. And there's no, you know, so we're talking about hardwoods. And you know, the other thing you can think of is that, that butt rot, but you would still expect to see, you wouldn't expect to see this, looks like water being, or bleach being poured down it. And you and on butt rot, you might see the conks on it. This one, you won't see the conks. And you have that flu. So, okay, the next one was sun skull. Do you want to take this one? Sure. So if you've got damage to the tree that's all on the south facing side, it tends to be all on the south facing side of the tree um, where the bark is away. You may get um, also some callus formation around the edge. Um, that can be due to, to sun scald. Um, and also very similar, and I don't know how you tell it apart, sun scald, solar heat, um, freezing injury, they can all cause a very similar type of damage. Um, a way to tell this apart from canker, um, you know, one is caused by uh, physical damage and the other one is caused by a, a fungus. And on this one, and she, she has it written on the slide, the south facing side, and you know, you're you get the moose sun on the south facing side of a slope or on a tree. So you would expect most of these injuries, if you're talking about a neighborhood, to be on that south side. So if you see several trees, there's all on the south side. Might be this. Uh, we also see this a lot in greenhouses. Again, I'm going to go back to my growing tomatoes in the greenhouse. It's easy on a Louisiana day in the middle of December when it warms up to you know, 80 degrees and your greenhouse all of a sudden gets up to 90 to get sun scald sometimes. And, and um, that, um, so that, that's very common more for nurseries too, uh, in, in, tree, in tree, tree settings. Yeah, I think about it a lot of times in landscape settings where trees that might not be usually way out, really out in the open and expo exposed to so much um, sun and more exposed to the elements than they usually would be um, instead of in a protected forest setting. Um, they I, may tend to get uh, sun scald. And, and I guess this would be more common for thin bark trees too, would it? I would think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that would make a lot of sense. So, so kind of like that that fire damage. We, we you know, the thin bark tree is more going to be more susceptible to things like this. So again, we're talking about magnolias, maples, beeches, and of course, we all know, you know maples are planted all over for urban settings. We have a bunch mm -hmm. on campus here. And they they would be more prone, I, I would think. Yeah, I would think so too. And now that you mention it, I think I've yeah. only ever seen it on yeah. trees with thin bark. Yeah. Um, I think this might be our last one. And um, wildlife and livestock. And when we first started putting this together, I was just thinking about deer and maybe rabbits or. Um, nipping off the tips of our trees, which I, I always have an issue. But when you think about all the different wildlife we have and some feral um, feral livestock too, uh, there's a lot of different injuries we can have. On well, the top left, we have beaver damage. Always a big issue. Um, one of the most destructive animals we have throughout North America really. Uh, they dam things up, they keep growing their ponds, and they keep cutting down Sometimes rather large trees. Usually you'll see this damage you know, right at the base because beavers aren't that tall. Of course, we have deer. Deer can rub on the tree. They're rubbing that velvet off uh, of their antlers, or they can nip, nip our trees. This is especially an issue with hardwood plantings, uh, especially some areas of the state or of the country where they have very, very dense deer populations. You have to put protective covering around our hardwoods just to give them a chance because the deer just ravage them. I've seen several places up in the Northeast like that. Um, a more recent issue that we're realizing is feral pigs, feral hogs. In the bottom left, you can see where they rooted up this person's yard, caused a little damage to that. It was like a live oak tree at the base. The major damage on this one would be rooting up the roots. Um, Talking to other foresters, most of us don't see it as a huge issue unless we're trying to regenerate a spot. And, you know, overnight, big sounder of hogs can take out a couple acres fairly easy if they get really, if they're hungry. And, and what a lot of people don't think about is uh, 
feral horses. Uh, I know I was talking to some Forest Service people last year down in Kasachi, uh close to Alexandria. They, they're still having trouble, I guess, with feral horses out there eating the bark off of trees and rubbing on them and causing all kinds of weird issues. Of course, you can imagine where if you had some, you're used to when we had free range cattle 30, 40 years ago in South Louisiana, this would have been an issue as well. Um, those are the ones we came up with. Um, so uh, with that, we are done with going through these 24. Uh, anybody have any other questions or comments? I, I just want to tell you both that I really appreciate you taking your time to do this. I, I feel like whoever watches this or participates in this should, should get some college credit. And I know, I'm, I know how hard you work. I know uh, I know what it's like for you guys. It's like the first week of school. I know I know Tech just just entered back into the semester, and I came to you and asked you to do this just because of the timing of our contest. And and I know you didn't just throw this together in a few minutes. And I just personally appreciate what you're doing for our organization and for our kids and for our teachers because we changed all these rules, but we didn't do a good job of providing solid professional development. Uh, throughout the summer on, on some of these more detailed aspects of our new rules. But I can I can honestly say as director that s teachers and students now have a resource that, that they can go to, to to learn this part of the contest. And if you wouldn't mind emailing me that PowerPoint, I'd love to share it on yeah. our website. We can do that. And we can, yeah, as, as we go through and learn about this contest a little bit more, I'm sure we'll tweak it in coming years. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I know last summer we tried to get a training um, get together for the advisors, and you know, we they, we ought to be able to do that this coming summer, and this would be a valuable valuable thing to add. It was nice doing this just because it helps us get ready for when we host the contest here in a few weeks too. So it's going to make it a lot easier on us here in a little bit. Um, so this is our first time too on this. So uh, anyway, well that's good, Eric. We'll post it on our YouTube videos, share it with our, our social media, and okay. give our kids teachers a chance to, to watch it and, and post that. We'll post the PowerPoint on the website, and hopefully um, we just increase the the pest, uh, the pests and disorders uh, educational aspect of our students in the state tenfold, and that's, that's the main goal here is to yeah. keep moving forward and, and making these kids and teachers aware of these issues, and I appreciate it. I, I don't have the expertise that you guys had when people – give their time to, to help us out. I, I just can't thank you enough. Well, we're glad to help you out. And um, I'll send you that PowerPoint here soon. But when, when y'all get this posted, just uh, we send me a link so I can send it to our folks and let them know we're doing something around here. <laughs> and uh, if you will copy Dr. Sims email on for me, okay. I can the list server to keep abreast of what's going on in that. Yeah. That'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, guys. Go Bulldogs. Thanks, Eric. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. You are the only participant.